Onamon Orionaya. We are in chapter 10 today of the Srimad Bhagavatam. Departure of Lord Krishna for Devaraka. Questions, comments, thoughts, anything, please put them down below. I welcome any conversation on what we read today or any other video you catch. As we work our way through this book and then many others on this channel, so check out my other videos. Shanaka Muni asked, After killing his enemies who desired to usurp his rightful inheritance, how did the greatest of all religious men, Maharaja Yudhishthira, assisted by his brothers, rule his subjects? Surely he could not freely enjoy his kingdom with unrestricted consciousness. Sutta Swami said, Sri Krishna, the Supreme Personality of Godhead, who is the maintainer of the world, became pleased after re-establishing Maharaja Yudhisthira in his kingdom, and after restoring the Kura dynasty, which had been exhausted by the bamboo fire of anger. Maharaja Yudhisthira, after being enlightened by what was spoken by Bhishma Deva and Sri Krishna, the infallible, engaged himself in matters of perfect knowledge because all his misgivings were eradicated. Thus he ruled over the earth and seas and was followed by his younger brothers. During the reign of Maharaja Yudhisthira, the clouds showered all the rain that people needed, and the earth produced all the necessities of man in profusion. Due to its fatty milk bag and cheerful attitude, the cow used to moisten the grazing ground with milk. The rivers, ocean, hills, mountains, forests, creepers, and active drugs in every season paid their tax quota to the king in profusion. Because of the king's having no enemy, the living beings were not at any time disturbed by mental agonies, diseases, or excessive heat or cold. Sri Hari, Sri Krishna, resided in Hastinaparapura for a few months to pacify his relatives and please his sister, Subrata. Afterwards, when the Lord asked permission to depart and the king gave it, the Lord offered his respects to Maharaja Yudhisthira by bowing down at his feet, and the king embraced him. After this, the Lord, being embraced by others and receiving their obeisances, got into his chariot. At that time, Subrada, Drapadi, Kunti, Uttara, Gandhari, Dritashtra, Yuyutsa, Kripakarya, Nakula, Sahadeva, Bhim Masena, Dramaya, and Satyavati all nearly fainted because it was impossible for them to bear separation from Lord Krishna. The intelligent, who have understood the Supreme Lord in association with pure devotees and have become freed from bad materialistic association, can never avoid hearing the glories of the Lord, even though they have heard them only once. How then could the Padavas tolerate his separation? For they had been intimately associated with his person, seeing him face to face, touching him, conversing with him, and sleeping, sitting, and dining with him. All their hearts were melted for him on the pot of attraction. And they looked at him without blinking their eyes, and they moved hither and thither in perplexity. The female relatives, whose eyes were flooded with tears out of anxiety for Krishna, came out of the palace. They could stop their tears only with great difficulty, and they feared that tears would cause misfortune at the time of departure. When the Lord was departing from the palace of Haristan Purna, different types of drums like the Rindiga, Dola, Nagra, Dundri, and Dundubi, and flutes of all different types, all sounded together to show him honor. Out of a loving desire to see the Lord, the royal ladies of the Kuras got up on top of the palace, and smiling with affection and shyness, they showered flowers upon the Lord. At that time, Arjuna, the great warrior and conqueror of sleep, who is the intimate friend of the most beloved Supreme Lord, took up an umbrella which had a handle of jewels and was embroidered with lace and beads. Udava and Satyaki began to fan the Lord with decorated fans, and the Lord, as master of Madhva, seated on scattered flowers, commanded them along the road. It was being heard here and there that the benedictions being paid to Krishna were neither befitting nor unbefitting, because they were all for the Absolute, who was now playing the part of a human being. 
absorbed in the thought of the transcendental qualities of the Lord who is sung in select poetry, the ladies and the roofs of all the houses began to talk of him. This talk was more attractive than the hymns of the Vedas. They said, here he is, the original personality of Godhead, as we definitely remember him. He alone existed before the manifested creation of the modes of nature, and him only because he is the Supreme Lord, all living beings merge, as if sleeping at night, their energy suspended. Lord Vishnu, again desiring to give names and forms to his parts and parcels, the living entities place them under the guidance of material nature. By his own potency, material nature is empowered to recreate. Here is the same Supreme Personality of Godhead whose transcendental form is experienced by the great devotees who are completely cleansed of material consciousness by dint of rigid devotional service and full control of life and senses. And that is the only way to purify existence. Oh, dear friends, here is that very personality of God whose attractive and confidential pastimes are described in the confidential parts of Vedic literature by his great devotees. It is he only who creates, maintains, and annihilates the material world and yet remains unaffected. Whenever there are kings and administrators living like animals in the lowest modes of existence, the Lord in his transcendental form manifests his supreme power. The truth positive shows special mercy to the faithful, performs wonderful activities, and manifests various transcendental forms as is necessary in different periods and ages. Oh, how supremely glorified is the dynasty of King Yadu, and how virtuous the land of Mathura, where the supreme leader of all living beings, the husband of the goodness of fortune, has taken his birth and wandered in his childhood. Undoubtedly, it is wonderful that Davarka has defeated the glories of the heavenly planets and has enhanced the celebrity of the earth. The inhabitants of Davarka are always seeing the soul of all living beings in his, Krishna's, loving feature. He glances at them and favors them with sweet smiles. Oh, friends, just think of his wives, whose hands he has accepted, how they must have undergone vows, baths, fire sacrifices, and perfect worship of the Lord of the universe to constantly relish now the nectar from his lips by kissing. The damsels of Vrajabuni would often faint just by expecting such favors. The children of these ladies are Pradyamna, Samda, Amba, etc., and their ladies like Rukmi, Satyabama, and Jambavati, who were forcibly taken away by him from their Svayamvara ceremonies after he defeated many powerful kings, headed by Shishupala. And other ladies were also forcibly taken away by him after he killed Bamasura and thousands of his assistants. All of these ladies are glorious. All of these women auspiciously glorify their lives despite their being without individuality and without purity. Their husband, the lotus-eyed personality of God, had never left them alone at home. He always pleased their hearts by making valuable presentations. While the ladies of the capital were greeting him and taking, talking in this way, the Lord, smiling, accepted their good greetings and casting the grace of his glance over them, and then departed from the city. Maharaja Yudhisthira, although no one's enemy, engaged four divisions of defense, that being horse, elephant, chariot, and army, to accompany Lord Krishna, the enemy of the demons. The Maharaja did this because of the enemy, and also out of affection for the Lord. Out of profound affection for Lord Krishna, Bhandavas, who were of the Kuru destiny, accompanied him a considerable distance to see him off. They were overwhelmed with the thought of future separation. The Lord, however, persuaded them to return home, and he proceeded towards Devaraka with his dear companions. O oh, Shanaka, the Lord then proceeded towards Kurujangala, Pansala, Shurasena, the land on the bank of the river Yuma, Brahmavata, Kurashatra, Matsya, Sarasvata, the province of the desert, and the land of scanty water. After crossing these provinces, he gradually reached the Savrira and Habira provinces, then west of these reached Avarka at last. On his journey through these provinces, he was welcomed, worshipped, and given various presentations. In the evening, in all places, the Lord suspended his journey to perform evening rites. This was regularly observed after sunset, and thus ends chapter 10. 
First, again, my apologies, because Sanskrit is not my first, second, third tongue, and I just, it, it's just a stumbling block for me. I learn languages better by hearing them versus just trying to pick them up and memorizing sounds. I, I just, I can't. Um, so my apologies for stumbling over the names. Uh, I was thinking the other day, I, I, I wonder, all these places that were just named, do they still exist? Or do we know where they are? Uh, if they do not still exist. And can we find them? I know I've seen pictures of in India uh, where Krishna and Arjuna had their meeting on the battlefield in the Bhagavad Gita. You know, there, there's the big statue there of the chariot. I've seen pictures of that. That'd be awesome to see. Do we have markings in these other places? Basically, if you went to India, could you trace, could you do a tour of where Krishna went? and where he walked, and all these cities. C can you see it? Are there are there memorials here? You know? I'm just curious. I actually don't know. I haven't Googled it. I probably should. I probably can when I have a moment. But it, it would just it's just really interesting because we never hear about these things. Of course, in the West, we hear about Jerusalem, um, Dome of the Rock, um, you know, uh, saints in here and there, and their shrines. But you never hear about places Krishna went, you know? I didn't really know up until like a year ago that we knew where, or just about where the Bhagavad Gita took place. You know, we just never hear about that because ignorance, ignorance of Krishna, Krishna in the West. For all the learning of yoga and all this stuff, we really don't know much uh, about Hindu history. Anyways, uh, maybe some of you have links, some of you know this though these places or you know that you can go to these places not that i'm going anytime soon um but it would be really interesting to see photos of that so if you have links share them down below and thank you as always for joining me on this this tour of text essentially i just made it my goal at new year's um this 2022 dawn to read these texts that i've read about so many times i felt empty i felt like i was missing something and Reading them with you is a motivation to get up in the morning, take my shower, and so my hair doesn't look so good because I haven't gotten it ready yet and I haven't put my tie on for work. And um, reading them with you, you know, is motivation. So if you've wanted to read them, hopefully seeing these videos come up every other day has helped you. And it's not the easiest to read, though. My apologies. But that's the way it goes. <laughs> And, uh, yeah, with that, look forward to your comments, questions, and all good thoughts. Have a good day. Thank you. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare.